We're about 15 months out from our anticipated launch date with about two years worth of work to do. Uh, so with that in mind, we are hoping to round up a pair of, for lack of better term, interns for the summer and maybe a bit beyond. So we've hired KP, who is an experienced boatwright, and that's already making a really big difference. And we don't need another person with quite that level of skill. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have the money to pay someone with quite that level of skill either. But thanks to our patrons and everyone who has supported to the project, we're able to pay Anne and Ben and KP and keep the project rolling. And I think we have just enough to be able to help out a pair of interns for the summer and maybe a bit beyond. So if someone lives locally, uh, we can throw some money your way. If someone's coming from afar, what we're looking at doing is renting a house for the two interns and for KP to live at. So, you know, we can help out in, in either of those ways. There's not a ton of funds to go around, but we certainly don't expect to someone to come live and work for free. We'll help you out in at least one of those regards. There's a lot of prep work and finish work to help KP and I out. We also have a lot of independent projects. So we'd love to find two people who want to come full time through the summer, maybe beyond, give KP and I a hand. Uh, and when KP and I are in good shape, have their own projects. So there's rigging, there's electrical, there's diesel, there's fiberglass and finish. There's all sorts of stuff, spar making. So if anyone has a real interest in any one of these, has a decent amount of skills, but really wants to hone them, uh, get in touch, check out the website. There's some more information and a survey there. And we're looking to have a couple of folks start sometime in May around the open house. So if you think that could be you, get in touch and I uh, would love to chat and work with you. Welcome back to the Boathouse. This week, Steve shed some light on the shipmate stove that will get more or less installed in this episode, and he'll explain what he intends to use for fuel while aboard. And then the whole crew, myself not included, took a field trip to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to pour some bronze hardware based on pieces salvaged from Victoria. Look at this level. I had a little chunk of locus here that I got to install to hold this metal kind of partition bulkhead up and anchor this forward part of it. When I had Evan make this partition, I had him add a piece of stainless steel here that protrudes down so we could attach it to the frames and keep that from rocking port to starboard. Uh, but we've got a gap here between the frames and we also have a gap with the planking, and we wouldn't want this metal edge gouging against the plank anyways. So I fashioned this locust block here. Come up just a little more. There we go. And you can see there's a rebate so that when this is screwed tight, the bracket here is pushing down on all of the locusts and not just onto the screws and shear. And I'm going to put in a couple stainless steel screws. Smart idea spanning the planks too. Yep. Yeah, and you can see that I'm not just on one plank. I'm spanning three. Black locust into oak. Black locust into oak. Like butter. All right. Now, I can release this and see if we remain level or not. Oh yeah, beautiful, that'll do.
I've got to figure out how many of the wafer lights to put into the galley area uh, and what their coverage is going to be when they're mounted on the overhead or if they're mounted on the underside of the decking. And figuring out how they're going to look during broad daylight is tough because it's really bright out and it's hard to see what the lights are doing. So coming out first thing in the morning as the sun is just coming up is pretty perfect time. There's enough light to see what I'm doing in the boat and to not uh, overpower the lights. So after playing with the lights and wiring them up to the Goal Zero battery, the decision was to put three lights in the stainless steel overhead, one directly over each stove and one in the back to light up the storage area back there. Well, we've got our patterns here. Uh, so we've got the base underneath the stove. We've got the outboard back face. We've got a little piece that's gonna guard the mahogany trim in the front on the inboard face of the stove. And we got our pattern that's gonna go up against the bulkhead. So the next step here is to get all of these cut out of the cement board, fit into the boat, and then we can start working on some tile. And that is why the heater is on in the boat. It's a little chilly today to do tile. And we're gonna make all of these come apart. So they're each panel is gonna be individual. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to build them all and panel them in the boat today and then very gingerly pick them up, carry them inside and let them cure in the house overnight. We'll see how that goes.
Hey, KP, good timing. Hey. Can you give me a What's hand up? with this wood stove? Sure. I can usually muscle it around, but now that there's tile to break, I think I'd like a hand. <laughs> no problem. We put the wood stove in here, and I'm, I'm not totally loving it. And what I'm not loving is this foot right here is bumping up against the angle, so we can't get the stove any closer to the tile. And then the stove, when it's going, is going to be pretty hot. The firebox is right here. This is going to be the hottest part of the stove. And it's pretty close. You know, you still have quite a bit of room here. Um, but it wouldn't be too terribly difficult to give the stove a hip check. So if we pop the stove back out of here, the feet come off really easily. And I think we can set the stove up on some pads instead of the feet, which will lower it and let us get outboard a little bit more. Uh, and I think that that's where we're going to want it. So let's see what that looks like. I like that so much better already. Yep. There's a couple things still left to do for the install here. Like I said, we've got to cock all these seams. And if you know a good compound, I'm all ears. And the stove also needs to be anchored down. So you can see there's a ring on either side here. And we're going to have to drill a hole in the tile and anchor that down so that if the boat's rocking and rolling or heaven forbid goes upside down, we don't have the whole stove becoming a drift. And the stove, a lot of people comment on how big it is and how much fuel we're going to have to store for it and how all that's going to work. And the size of the stove is, is really, really deceiving. Uh, so this big box here is actually the oven. So there's a Come on. There's a divider tray in there. Uh, and it's not, not a bad size little oven. And then the firebox for the stove is actually right here. Uh, and this is about the size of wood that you'd be putting in this firebox. So we would not be having stove logs like we put in those stove at home. It would be pieces like this that you would put in there. And a piece like this doesn't even fit. And these here are about what you would be looking to do. So we're not talking about giant pieces of wood and storing cords of wood on deck. And the other thing is this is a multi-fuel stove. So if we look in the very top here, you can look down inside the firebox and there's a shaker grate in here. And that is for when you want to burn coal. Uh, and coal is a lot denser and burns a lot longer than wood. You can see that the smoke comes up and underneath and out the chimney here. And we have a little lever here. And what this does is it reroutes the smoke. So with this in one orientation, the smoke comes underneath and directly up the chimney. With it closed, the smoke goes over, has to go down around the oven and back up. So you can only do that when the stove is, is really nice and established and going. But this lever here lets you direct how much air is going past the oven and how much air is going around the oven. So this is essentially your thermostat for the oven, getting it hotter or colder. You have uh, air down on the bottom here where you can adjust how much the stove is drafting. And this is where the ashes would come out. And I mentioned that this burns coal and that is the primary fuel that I intend to burn in this stove. So I went out and picked up a 40 pound bag of coal and I think it will fit in the locker down here, but we haven't tried yet. So let's see how that goes. So this is anthracite heating coal uh, and you can see it's kind of stretched out here, but it says nut coal. So you can get stove coal, which is pretty big chunks. You can get nut coal, which is medium size, and you can get rice. And with our shaker grate, rice would go right through it. With how small our firebox is, I think uh, coal stove fuel is too big. And I think the nut is going to be about the ticket. And when I made the door for this, I made a double door. So that piece will go in and get hinged. And then this little door from Victoria will go right in here and also get hinged. 
I would imagine. We could probably almost fit two of those in there. Easily one and a half. And then maybe I'll put the door in. Latch that. And you can imagine just opening that up, reaching in and grabbing your little bit of coal. The general consensus is that this 40 pound bag of coal should last a week, maybe a little more. Um, and that's very dependent obviously on how hot we burn the stove and uh, if we're having this fire going 24 hours a day or if we're just lighting it in the morning or the night. There's a lot of variables obviously. But if you can imagine that this one bag of coal is roughly a week's worth of fuel uh, and we can put one and a half under here and we can put a couple in the bilge, we could throw one or two on deck it really would not take a lot of coal to have a month or more worth of fuel for the boat. Uh, so I think having that is, is pretty reasonable. It's not like we're gonna have to stack cords and cords of wood. And the stove is multi-fuel, so we can burn wood, we can burn coal, we can burn charcoal briquettes, uh, we can burn dried cow patties, we can burn the workbench, uh, we can burn just about anything that we'll burn. So those are, those are the sizes that we would be working with, which would fit pretty well in the stove. You also notice that we have the stove facing fore and aft, uh, and that's so that you don't have the doors popping open when we're on attack. If we were to turn the stove and the boat were to rock, uh, there's a chance that these doors are gonna fly open. You wouldn't have the stove lit underway in heavy weather anyways, um, but you know, boats move, things happen. So having it set up fore and aft is, is just a little bit safer than setting it up port to starboard. And like a lot of things in the interior, this is as far as we're gonna take it for now. Uh, we'll work on the deck and all of that this summer and get that buttoned up. And this coming winter, we'll take a lot of things in the interior out and take things apart a little bit so that we can do a really good clean and final varnish before we get ready to launch in the spring, which will be just over a year from now. It's crazy, can't wait. <laughs> Throughout the journey of building Arabella, there's been a lot of things that have come up that I never in a million years would have anticipated. Uh, and one such thing was getting an email from a professor at MIT. And for those of you that don't know, MIT is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, that we would get an invite from a professor there and get the offer to go use their labs and do some bronze casting with their students for Arabella. Uh, I definitely don't think I would have believed you. But as luck would have it, uh, we got an email a while back from a professor there uh, who does some bronze casting with students and he wanted to know if we had any bronze that they could use as patterns and if there was anything that we had from Victoria that we would like duplicated. So Danny came out and picked up a open style Harishoff cleat, uh, a boom gallow and a rope hook and brought those back to the school. Unfortunately, classes were canceled for a while in person so they couldn't do any casting. But we got the call recently from Danny that school was back in session and that they were gonna cast some bronze cleats and he wanted to know if we wanted to come and be a part of that. And there was no way we were gonna miss that opportunity. It just so happened that Anne was up in Maine working on her sailboat and was coming through Boston at the exact time that the students would be packing the green sand into the flasks and preparing to do the pour. So Anne swung by and worked with the students and watched and observed as they took the patterns from the cleats and put that into the green sand for casting and carved vents and did all sorts of other things to get ready for the casting process. I've never used the itty bitty flask. Why don't you hand me that one? This is obviously the pour, this is a pattern. 
and you see that it's two parts, right? I could show you how I made these. I'll, once we get going, I'll bring this stuff out. This pattern was actually made off of a casting that came from a salvaged boat. So this is a pattern from Victoria. Um, anyway, so you're going to have a part. The way we're going to do this is we're going to start with the drag. It goes down on the ground. We're actually going to do two in each flask, so you could each grab a pair. Um, we lay it down. We use what's called a riddle, which is that screen thing. What's so funny? Everything has a special name, and I love it. It has. Yes, it does. <laughs> it's the yeah, casting parlance. Hey, just wait till if you get into boats. That's a whole other. <laughs> Yes, right. <laughs> I'm kind of Who's wary of that? pushing it. If you push it too much, your part's going to move. But this stuff gets wow. really jammed down. Like, you can really yeah. lean on that now. Mm. Yep. That's why when you show up with like three buckets of sand and you say, oh, is that enough? You know, it hacks really tight. Okay. Now the important thing here is we're going to take this. Where's the brush? Okay. And now just lightly. Over the whole face. I'll do a part of it here. I just take this and just do it, do it like that, right? Because what we're going to do now is we're going to put the uh, we're going to put the cope on, and we're going to fill it, pack it, and then we separate it and then pull the pattern out. So you'd be really bummed if you didn't have the parting powder because when you separate it, it would just tear right at the parting plane. And then in the coat side, what we're going to do is, remember, we want to vent these really well. So we're going to take the copper pipe. We're going to jam a hole all the way through there, 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 and there. And then we're doing uh, probably not the best practice, but we're actually gating, meaning filling the part right from the sprue and the well. So these little channels here are going to fill the bottom, the feet of the cleats. And we made little X's so that we feed the bronze in both directions for both sides. And this is one example of that, where this is the bottom half being the well. The top half here that was sawn off was the sprue. And these little elements here are the gates. So the bronze comes down, splashes around in here, starts filling up and runs through the gates and then fills the rest of the cleat. And this foot was lost because we had trapped air. So now we're venting the uh, mold very differently. So these little holes are all vents. Allows all of the air to get uh, come out of the mold. Hopefully it'll work. So the students brought out their flasks that were ready, uh, that were all packed with the green sand and ready for casting. And they fired up the furnace and poured in some scrap bronze. Uh, they took it out and poured it into each of the flasks. And this was the first time being a part of any metal casting other than our lead pour. And obviously the lead pour was a very different scale and uh, completely different set of resources for it. Uh, so it was an incredibly different experience. This was really neat to see how a, how a foundry does it in a really controlled setting on a small scale. After all the bronze was poured, 
Uh, we had to wait a couple hours, so we hung out in the lab and observed as students worked on their various projects of the different machines. Once the bronze was cool enough to be handled, the students took their turns breaking open the flasks and pulling out the two bronze cleats. So in each pour, there would be two cleats, and the idea would be that if uh, they came out, that one would go to the student and one would go to us, uh, so we could have a few more cleats to add to Arabella. Since Victoria was a cutter and Arabella is a catch, we have a few more lines that we need to tend to. So having those extra cleats would be really amazing. It was really cool to see the students breaking open the flasks and seeing the different ways that they uh, put in the vents and where they poured the bronze. So they set each of them up a little bit differently so that they could see any variation through the process because obviously this is a school and the, the object is to learn. And all of the castings came out really well. There was a few that are going to need a couple small welding repairs, but nothing major. After the students had the bronze out, the castings are pretty rough and the vents are still all attached. So they took them over to the sandblaster and got them cleaned up a bit. And then it was on to the bandsaw to cut off everything that was excess. And the castings still need a decent amount of grinding and cleaning uh, to get them into a functional form. But the castings look really great. They did an amazing job. And we are over the moon to have some cleats for Arabella that were cast by the students at MIT. Uh, I never would have thought that that would be something that would transpire. We also got to go to the MIT dock on the river and go see the boats that they have for the sailing club and for the students that they can take out. Uh, and it was pretty amazing to see this whole fleet of dinghies that any student at MIT can take out as long as they know how to use them. And if they don't know how to use them, they can take the class to learn how to use them. They also had some cat boats and a little larger boat that wasn't there at the moment. Uh, so it was really neat to go see that as well. So thank you so much to Danny and the students at MIT. Uh, it was a really great experience to be able to go and see some casting of bronze and to uh, get a few more cleats for Arabella. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, it was a really, really amazing facility. We had a great time and uh, hopefully we'll be able to go back someday. So the big idea is I just cut this acrylic box and just use packing tape to hold it. You go ahead and you pour, uh, I don't know if I suspended this, I don't exactly, I forget what I did now. Basically, I think I suspended this in air. And then you pour in this uh, soft silicone uh, right to the depth of say, okay that's a reasonable parting line. Let that cure, uh, and then uh, you can put down a little uh, spray of uh, parting material. I think it's another silicone. And then pour your other goop into it, which happens to be this goop, like that. Let that cure. Cut the packing tape. This all falls away. Grab this, and now you have your mold. So this is a replica now of uh, Victoria's cleat. Once we have this, then I can use this as a mold to pour that plastic that they're using for the pattern. And that's uh, this harder, I think, urethane plastic. Um, 
And then we pour the two halves, match them together, and now you have your replica. At least that's how I did it. But.